why is it kale? And why are we in a why is she uh, talking about stolen hours in a decrepit barn with a really just like named character first of all? But anyways, I'll have thoughts and uh, later. Yeah, you it comes back around. Does um, that's it? all yeah, it does. That's all I'm gonna say. It Do we actually name him for a reason? Yeah. Okay. It comes back around. And I don't know if it comes back anymore, like in the sequels, but I wouldn't be surprised if it did. I'll just put it that way. Anyway, welcome <laughs> to the Semi-Bookish Podcast. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hello! Uh, we are not actually talking about Akatar today, unfortunately, for Darn. all of you. Um, That's next week. Is it, though? No. Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, are we? Are we no. making this a podcast read? Because I don't know if I... Um, <laughs> no. I'm not ready for that. <laughs> no, that's at least until, like, <laughs> next year, probably, so Grant has time to read Akatar. I, I, I am... I mean, I will say, like, you know, I read book one. I enjoyed book one. I gave it a four out of five on Goodreads. I really think it's more of a 3.8, because I'm sorry. <laughs> we'll if talk about you, it later. <laughs> yeah. If you if your smut series is literally you and everyone else calling it smut, your first book should have good smut, smut. and it didn't. <laughs> it had smut. It just wasn't yeah. good. So, so anyways, uh, you know, we're going to start with the you. So, Tony, because you're already talking about it, what are you, what are you reading, watching, playing, doing, whatever? What's happening? I made a list. You made a list? Ooh, yes, because that's how much I have to talk about. Um, I will keep it brief. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> the shortest answer to what am I playing right now? Nothing. Um, I <laughs> wrapped up my four... I was playing four... Oh, my God, I forgot. Okay, so I'm not playing anything right now, but within the next week, the new Star Wars games... In fact, I oh, think isn't it, it comes out on Friday. Uh, it's called Outlaws, Star Wars yeah, Outlaws. Yeah, because it, it has out. to do with the scavengers. Yep, so, um... See, I know th- some... Tony... I'm not Jon Snow, I know some things. Tony wasn't going to do this, the first time but here. today... Tony oh, have you not seen, the, heard the game yet? It's I don't like, think so. It's like a... It's like... It's, an, it's the first open world yeah. Star Wars game. Minus... And you play as a chick. Yes, okay. you do. Um, Mine is like Star Wars Galaxies, maybe? Although that, that was an MMO, so maybe. Yeah, so it's the first. Yeah, it's the first like like in the tradition of Skyrim. Okay, is what is what I was is what it sounds like to me. Um, and it comes out on Friday, and I'm pre-ordering it because I love myself. Um, but apart from that, I am not playing that yet because it's not out yet. So I played the four Star Wars games that are my favorites. Um, Jedi Survivor is still my favorite game ever made. Uh, <laughs> sorry, hands down, I'm I'm a plebeian. I'll take it. Um. Anyway, so that's what I'm not doing. I'm not playing anything right now. Um, I am reading two books at the moment. Very, I just started both of them. I have two chapters into one, uh, a, few, you know, a couple chapters into the other one. Anyway, uh, one is called The Serpent and the Wings of Night mm-hmm. by Carissa Broadbent. Um, and it's a romanticy with vampires, and it's really interesting right now. Like, it's very... It's exactly the mood that you would want, right, for a vampire novel. But I like, too, that because it's secondary world, she's not giving us your traditional American, you know, Anne Rice but worse version of a vampire. You know what I mean? Like, she's not... So you're, like, in, like, a parallel world where vampires exist or something? Is that what you're saying? Yes, we're, like, not just vampires, vampire kingdoms, vampire empires. Like, there's... And the way in which she describes the vampire is really fascinating. I mean, they have wings. Um, And, like, like giant bat wings, almost. So they're, like, man bats, but... So, like, the, uh, like the vampire lord in Skyrim, almost... Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Something. Yeah. Something that fits a more second secondary world kind of setting where you're not relying upon Dracula and all his descendants. You know. Yeah. Um, so I like that. I really like the protagonist. I think she's um, she's tough without being the your usual like spunky strong girl protagonist. Like, eh. No, she's she could do some stuff. So we'll see. It's a big book. We'll see. Um, The other book that I started reading uh, just last night, actually, is called The Principle of Moments by, I am going to butcher this name because I've never heard it pronounced aloud, but I'm going to try, Esme Jikiemi Pearson, um, who is a black British writer who wrote a space opera. Um, And I read a really good review last year, and then I bought the copy (laughs) like a couple weeks ago and I just started reading it um and it's you know it has a nice like mythic voice to it which I really find 
interesting for space opera, especially where space opera is right now, because space opera is very... It's in an interesting place right now. It's very confused, but it's, it's <laughs> got a nice mythic voice to it, um, this book. In does. regards to the language? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, not just the language, but the, 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 the concept. You can tell that it's heading in a... That these characters are meant to be uh, heroes. And so she's setting all of that up. And the way in which she takes her time to set it up and the prose that she uses really does make you feel like you're reading a space myth. Mm-hmm. Which is fun, right? Because, I mean, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's fun. Anyway, um, I watched some really cool things Ooh. lately, um, or am watching. So, in case of, I watched this anime that is tw- either 12 episodes or 14 episodes, and I don't feel like checking on my phone. It's called A Given, as in, like, you know, it's a given. Um, <laughs> G I V E N. It is an anime that is. Oh, the anime! Uh, the Got anime. It. It's an anime about a band. Two of the guys are in college, two of the guys are in high school. The college boys are falling in love with each other, the high school boys are falling in love with each other. It's adorable. It's heart wrenching because one of the high school boys is dealing with the uh, traumatic loss of a partner. And or a former, you know, partner, and so and and it's all tied into music because they're a band. Um, so everything that they're doing has to do with music in some way, shape, or form, including the grief because the guitar he's carrying around, um, and he's freaking out because he broke a string. Mm-hmm. I'm not spoiling anything. It's literally the first thing you learn in episode one is that he's broken a string on this guitar that he's carrying around, and he's freaking out because he has no idea that guitar strings can be fixed Mm -hmm. until the boy that he ends up having a crush on at some point during the show runs into him and is like what are you doing in my secret like sleeping spot at the school and the kid's like and then he's like also you broke your guitar string do you need somebody you need somebody to fix that and he's like you can fix guitar strings and like thus their romance is born you know and it's but it's it's beautifully written um the music is great and there are two follow-up movies that follow the rest of the manga arc um, so I'm really interested in watching those because the college boys did not even have a kiss by the end of the anime and I'm really mad about it. Um, but I read that it ends up happening later. Like they get their full blown romance in the next two mm-hmm. movies. So that's one thing I watched. The other thing is I am finally, Aaron, catching up. Finally, Aaron, <laughs> on My Hero Academia this past weekend. Yes! I still haven't gotten... To, uh, yeah, so I stopped at season yes. six, episode, like, two or three. Um, basically, oh, so you haven't gotten there yet. No, no, no. Well, so basically, Hawks had done a thing. That's where I started this past weekend. And yeah. then I went all the way through. I'm a few episodes past Dobby's Dance. <gasps> so... Yeah, so Some I know of the th- best voice acting work I have seen in a while. Yeah, so I know came from that. that episode. Yeah, that that episode was incredible. It's nuts. Mm-hmm. Like, it, it, if you have not seen My Hero Academia or gone or have not caught up to that point, in my opinion, some of the very best, very best voice acting is done in that episode. Spec- it's a, yeah, it's a solid episode. It's, yeah. Just as, you know, there's certain characters, like some Sasuke from Naruto episodes and Dobby, there are some, ep- like, shows that does voice acting well. And mm. Dobby, doesn't matter if you're watching it dubbed or subbed, by the way. Mm, sure. It's insane on both accounts. Nice. Yeah, insane no, a, on both accounts. It's a, it's a great reveal. It's also a great episode it's a great moment it's like and honestly season six at this point i'm still like going towards the end of, of season six um is easily i'm not gonna say it's my favorite season because it's not um i, no. I miss the school hijinks but it's the reason the show was made like you can find like once you get to season six you realize like Oh, these people didn't just want to tell a cute story about kids who get attacked at the end of the school year. This is not Power Rangers. No. Like, this is not Hogwarts. Like, this is, like... No. This is... There is a Dobby, though. There is a Dobby. Yeah, exactly. There is a Dobby. Dobby. So I would, say, I would say that what I came to the conclusion of watching what I was watching this weekend, just catching up, um, is that My Hero Academia, of the three big We're Gonna Criticize Superpowers properties... Oh, yeah. In my view, of the three, those three would be The Boys, My Hero, and Invincible. 
I have yet to try the boys, uh, but from everything I've heard from it, I'm probably going to dislike it very strongly. I um, will say... Without, that's just me. I haven't seen it yet. But Without spoiling the end, because I have seen the end of the manga, because we've already gotten to that point. It's mm. now finished. Mm-hmm. I will say, in terms of criticism on superpowers, you'll be happy with the ending. But in terms of wanting it to be wrapped up in a nice little bow and like wanting everybody to be happy, you will not be happy. Oh, I could it, it's, it's gonna. It's one of those yeah. like I could kill us about that. <laughs> the ending is kind of, in my opinion, without spoiling anything, is kind of really bittersweet in a way. I think it would have to be. Um, I mean, I, I think that's that. It, it, this show gets criminally underrated because it does spend five seasons in a, a single school year. Yes, which seems like a mistake, but if you ride the wave, which I loved doing, you, I mean, loving it helps. Once you get to season six, you see very clearly that they are trying to help us to understand that superpowers do not a hero make. In yes. fact, superhero superpowers do not a villain make. It's way more complicated yeah, no. than that. And the, I love that. The ending that. is very bittersweet, but it does feel like it does wrap it up very nicely in a bow. And it's very realistic. A lot of people were disappointed in it, but I think it was a very realistic, bittersweet ending. Oh, I think it makes sense. I'm I don't satisfied know. with it. Yeah. Because I, of how it ends. Yeah, I don't it know. Makes sense. I don't think that you can, if you're getting to the end of a story like this that you've been creating, I don't think that you can create the kind of ending that's going to satisfy the audience that first fell in love with the show. Because yeah. what you first fell in love with has to change. In season six, you are either going to, in season six, by the end of it, you're going to get to a point where you're like, I hate this and I don't want to keep going. Or, oh, they ruined my favorite show. Or, what the, are they really, like, you, there's. It's like Attack on Titans ending. It's the same thing. There's it's no. It's like you get to a certain point and then you're like, oh, yeah, there's really no we're doing up. this now. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see where they're going to take the show. Um, I, it's my favorite of the Let's Criticize Superpowers genre that's out there right now um i think invincible is over the top um to be perfectly honest i have to watch season two i've only seen the first season which yeah. i really which i really enjoyed but i wanted to enjoy season one of what? especially after invincible the, especially after the first episode but it just after a while i was just like okay that's nice and animated blood and bones didn't need it but okay i mean you know mm-hmm. but that's i love superheroes so you know i felt i didn't feel like they needed to be critiqued but if I did, my hero is the way that I, like, it's the story that is doing that for me. That it's like, oh, yeah, that is how I would critique superheroes within a superhero narrative, like, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, because, you know, in, in a way, my hero isn't a superhero narrative. It just has that as its framework. And yet, once you, again, once you get to season six, you kind of go... Oh, they weren't trying to tell a superhero story at all. This is rude. Because it is. It's just rude. Like, <laughs> as dark as they go in that, it's just rude. So, that's what I'm doing. Oh, the, apologize. yes. They should. I agree. The only other thing I should comment on is the other thing that I'm watching is Batman Cape Crusader. Oh, it's delicious. It's good? It's so good. It is, in my view, it's the show that they wanted to make in 1992, but because they were working with Warner Brothers and animated television in the early 90s, which was a hellscape, uh... They couldn't. You know what I mean? Like, if you look at things like the way the music is done in Batman the Animated Series, which I love, as opposed to the way they're doing the music in the Cape Crusader, the Cape Crusader, like, music fits that Dragnet radio drama and then television drama that Dragnet Dragnet later became, which is exactly what they wanted to do with Batman the Animated Series. But the music in Batman the Animated Series is not, that's not, that's not trying to be that. It's trying to be a cinematic score because they were trying to cash in on the 89 Batman craze. So, you know, with the Cape Crusader, they don't have a craze that they're cashing in on here. They just want to create a really solid animated Batman story that pulls from the noir aspects and the schlock that Batman used to be. And boy, do they, it's juicy. It's wonderful. And they send Bruce Wayne to therapy. I mean, he needs it. In the first three episodes. I mean, he needs it. No, no, it's not. But that's the that's the thing is that it's not because it's not it's not Batman going to therapy, it's not Batman going insane in Arkham Asylum. We've seen those stories ad nauseum. Right, in the but Batman Bruce Wayne needs it's, therapy. It's, it's, it's <laughs> Bruce Wayne overhears something at an auction, and is so mad that he punches the person who says it. Now, mind you, the person who says it 
shouldn't have said it. <laughs> but watching Bruce Wayne in therapy answer like the billionaire playboy that he's trying to personify in therapy is so deliciously uncomfortable, especially since his doctor is Dr. Harleen Quinzel. <laughs> it's the, it is a juicy, juicy moment. And that's all I'm going to say because you have to watch the rest of it for yourself. It is wonderful fun. I'm only on the third episode, half of the third episode. It's really fun. It's well worth it. Now, correct me if, I, if I'm wrong. Now, did the original like showrunner of the... Batman animated series mm-hmm. is he involved or yeah Bruce Tim who was I don't believe he was the original showrunner at the time but he was one of the executive producers of the original series okay. uh, the original animated series so yes he is he's the only name from that time period that we have now oh okay. that's probably what I was thinking yeah. of. Matt Reeves and JJ Abrams are the other executive producers and I think that's why it ended up in Amazon Prime because I think Amazon went to JJ Abrams and was like hey you haven't done anything in a while. What you got? And he was like, well, I got some people who are interested in doing an animated Batman again. And so they pulled it all together. I, it's honestly really great. I mean, it's the best thing J.J. Abrams has ever even come close to doing. So, you know. Not surprising. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah, he's not that great. Um, so anyway, that's my that's been my um, entertainment weekend, Grant. Grant, that's me. It's you. Yeah, that is your surprise. <laughs> yes. What's your entertainment weekend? He also has a list. Can you My, tell? It, it's, it's not a list. What is it's with a... all of us having lists today? <laughs> we work at a library. Do you really have to ask? <laughs> Grant, go. Yes, okay, so I'm not reading anything. I'm not really playing anything worth like mentioning, anything with a story or anything. So I will go through some movies that I've seen recently. Yeah. Um, kind of in a speed round type thing. First, Midnight Run huh? came out in 1988. It huh. stars uh, Robert De Niro and some guy who disappeared, and I don't even remember his name. But it's poor guy. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I'm I'm sure he's fine. Um, <laughs> but uh, so it's a kind of a buddy comedy, dark oh. comedy. Um, sure. Robert De Niro plays a uh, bondsman, or or, or he, I, I forget if he's like a bondsman or if he's paid by a bondsman. To, mm. uh, no, he's paid by a bondsman. He's kind of a uh, dog the bounty hunter. Type. Yeah, he's a, a, a bounty hunter. hunter. He's yeah, a bounty hunter. <laughs> exactly. That's what I'm trying to think. Of. He's Boba <laughs> <Yeah>. Fett. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, he uh, he's sent to uh, uh, find this guy who's he, he owes us he owes some money. Blah 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 blah. Mm-hmm. They have all sorts of misadventures and everything. Um, sure, it's a fine late '80s comedy i guess sure yeah de niro kind of feels I, I i warmed up to his performance in the beginning he definitely felt kind of out of his element you know despite mm. despite him being in a fair number of comedies you know throughout his career or whatever he just kind of felt like he was there but yeah. as, as it went on though and as the character's relationship grew and stuff you know it kind of it became more endearing and uh it's one of those movies that's weirdly rated r it's like chef almost where it would yeah be, it would be a pg-13 movie if there, there wasn't like Random f bombs. Yeah. The time. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's like a. I'll give it three stars. I'd say. Okay. Sure. Um, it's worth a watch if you don't have anything else going on. Uh, I watched Buffalo sixty six, mm. which I wanted to watch for a very long time. Um, it's directed by Vincent Gallo. It stars him and Christina Ricci. Oh, I love Christina Ricci. Yeah, she's very good. Yeah. Um, Vincent Gallo is a twat. <laughs> But I will don't not hear that word very often on the semi bookish podcast. Whip it out if you want. So. <laughs> no, no, it's okay. It's true, it's true though. It's, yeah, no, it's, um, yeah, that's who he is. Yeah, he. Uh, but I won't be. I'm not judging him. I'm judging the movie. Oh, um, the actor. The actor slash terrible. director Vincent Gallo. No, he's oh. he's a great actor. Oh, okay, okay, okay. And a good director. Just the character but is. Awful. The, well, the, the character is awful. I'm talking about him as a human being. Oh, as a human being, he's but, also awful. Okay, yes, cool. but I don't want to get into that. Yeah, no, sure. I'm talking about the movie. Yes. Um, yes. And I quite, I, I quite enjoyed it. Yeah. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. So we follow Gallo, who plays a person who's recently released from prison. Mm-hmm. He uh, he has lied to his parents that he has a wife, and so he more or less kidnaps Christina Ricci, um, uh, and sure her, makes her pretend to be his wife. Um, that's one way to do it. And they are both very broken, troubled people. And he does apologize for kidnapping her, which is something. So, you know, but... Uh, Aww. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, so really you're just getting in, getting inside the heads of these two broken people. Sure. Um, sure. And you get insight into, like, uh, Gallo's past with his family and stuff. You meet his family at one point. Yeah. And uh, you can kind of understand why he is the way he is. Sure. Um, there's some really cool artistic choices. Um the soundtrack is great. Mm. 
uh, any soundtrack with King Crimson is a plus one for me. Sure. So, uh, no, overall it was very good. Um, some of it felt very film schoolish, and it was his mm. debut movie. Like, like maybe if you would have just like, I don't know, sat down and like, is this a good idea? No. <laughs> sure. But, right. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No. And there's a scene towards the end that is very um, taxi driver esque. Okay. As in, like, ripped from Taxi Driver? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, yeah, that's a good movie. Uh, let's see. Um, I saw First Night with Richard Gere, which is awful, so I won't even talk about it. Uh, <laughs> and then I guess that leaves me with Blackberry. Um, oh, okay. Part of, part of the recent wave of, like, product movies. Um, oh, yeah, right. They're yeah, like Flaming Hot and stuff. Yeah. Um, this, yeah. Was, this, was, this was a good movie, though. Really? Um, okay, nice. It stars, I can't remember one guy's name, but it, the, the main attraction is Glenn Howerton from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Okay, sure. Who 100% they hired just so he could yell at the <laughs> top of his lungs, <laughs> which, in, which he does a very good job at. Oh, um, there you go. Though there is depth to his character. It's not It's not like they just paid him to, you know, scream. Go crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> It's not Danny DeVito's Penguin. Oh, I'm sorry. I digress. No. no. Um, <laughs> carry on. No, no issue with that. Um, so, yes. the uh, So, yeah. Um, it follows the creation of the Blackberry. Um, <gasps> the phone, obviously. Or the Peacher. <laughs> um, you start... We start from the very beginnings uh, with a small group of programmers. Um, and then they uh, they try to sell their idea to Glenn Howerton, who is this big Canadian businessman. Mm. Terrifying. Sure. Um, he initially p- brushes them off, and then he kind of looks into it in a little bit. He's like, I think these guys have something. Sure. Um, and then they kind of form an unlikely partnership, yada, yada, yada. Sure. It very much follows the mold of, like, the social network, mm-hmm. where it's not all it's cracked up to be, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. You push your friends away, blah, 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 blah. Sure. Um, yeah. But it's it's a very entertaining movie. Um, watch it for his performance alone. Okay. Yeah. Nice. And uh, I haven't done anything else. So, Aaron, it's your turn. Oh, it's my turn? It's your turn. Oh, no. All right. So, let's get the reading part out of the way first before I start (laughs) ranting about my Sims, because that'll take way too long. Yes, what are you reading? So, I'm simultaneously reading four books at once, because when when do I not? It's fair. Uh, First of all, let's get the horrible ones out of the way first, and then I will get into the actual good ones. Uh, Sure. Because that's how I feel at the moment. So, uh, at the very bottom of the list, which is confusing the heck out of me because I'm about 20% in on this and there's still no backstory as to what is happening. Um, it is called Losing Neverland and it's about it's by Evelyn Montgomery and it's supposed to be a dark romance where basically Peter and Hook are the exact same person. I thought it was a sequel to Finding Neverland. Uh, no. <laughs> no, they're the same person. They're aged up to 17. But they're the same person. Okay, there's room in Peter Pan for that, I think. There's room. There's room. The, they're the same person. So by the same person, I don't mean they're like doppelgangers. I mean it's they're like, like actually it's like the same. it's like the exact same person. It's like Batman and Bruce Wayne. Yeah. Okay. Which, okay, sure, fine, whatever. Or Doctor Jekyll and Mr. Winnie Hyde. has been left in London by herself basically for like the longest time because John and Michael decided it'd be a great idea to follow Peter up to Neverland. And then, like, never left. Um, and so, Peter keeps coming back to Wendy, vice versa, da 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 And then he kidnaps her back up to Neverland. And it's supposed to be, like... All this happens in the first 20% of the book? <laughs> yeah! Wow. And it's, it's right. going back and forth between, like, past and present, which, that, to be honest, I will say, let me say this, I'm looking at Goodreads reviews of this, and people are like, this is three stars, this is four stars, this is great, this is fine. This is a two. This is a solid two. For you. <laughs> two. Is it the, is it the writing generous. style, or is it the, Well, like... first of all, it's in first person, so, and there's more. <laughs> so you're already on Aaron's poop list. <laughs> <laughs> but it gets worse because not only is it in first person, but they're switching points of view. So every chapter is a different character. So it's not like so it's not like we're following who was it? Was it Hundred Thousand Kingdoms that's first person? Yes. Where you follow one character. Where you follow us. one yeah. character. This is not like Hunger Games where you're following one character. Right. Not only are we flip flopping between past and present, like every single chapter, we're also flipping between multiple different characters. How long is this book? 301 pages. Yeah, so I've noticed a trend and that that's been happening a lot in, in like, 
300 page books which is so baffling to me from a craft perspective because no, it's like from a craft perspective you realize how much you can't get done in 300 pages no. right why are you like <laughs> and at the same time I'm like reading it and I'm sitting here and I'm just like I don't know if you guys like so the audience can't the people listening can't see my face but the whole entire time I was reading little pages and my face just consecutively I could feel it just get more disgusted as time went on I did notice that and, and it was like, wasn't you guys it was this because <laughs> no, like what is happening in this and so then there's some which happens that's fine this is a dark romance it's a dark romance it comes with it however according to the Goodreads there's a second edition of the book where they edited out those scenes to make it more YA friendly um this is not this that this is the Kindle edition is not that copy I just left the building (laughs) (laughs) so I'm sitting here and not only is like the flip-flopping of the characters kind of a thing and kind of a problem for me because we went from Peter to Hook to Wendy to Hook again. Now we're on Tinkerbell. And I'm like, what is happening? Okay. Meanwhile, like, all of the smut, like, I just... I would give it, like, if I have to rate it on the scale, it's really mid. It's mid. Uh, It's not really well done. Does it reach the lemon? Uh, it reaches the lemon, but it's not that great in I... terms of like how it's... the reason that I don't like it is because we're just jumping right in, and this is supposed to be book one, by the way. It's just jumping right into like the action, into stuff, which right. is fine. That's great. I do like it when we jump right into things, but at the same time, the past like little like flashback backstory bit yeah. is not exactly explaining to me the one particular question that I want. Why are they the same person? Oh, why? I There's see. nothing that's explaining okay. why he's the same person. There's so nothing, they're kind of like dragging it out a little. There's nothing that explaining that's explaining why we're kidnapping Wendy in the first place. Outside of just he's really darkly in love with her and stalking her, basically. I mean, he is Captain Hook. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and who, by the way, has no hormonal in- impulses. So why people keep trying to make Captain Hook into like the villain that steals young women is like. But he has yeah. no like. No. Is this true? Because like in in the in the original Peter Pan like story, he, has, he does like, not care. Like, it's oh. not like canon. Like he has no. Well, well, yeah, but like yeah. he literally has like no like the Disney cartoon hook that you see. That's Captain Hook. Like that's like he's Let's not to a T. He's not deep or rich or interesting. Meanwhile, he's just boring. Like mm-hmm. at the same time, I'm also slogging my way through. I'm only six percent into this book. Yeah. Through Priest by Sierra Simone, which is like the weird priest romance. Yeah, I've so been seeing thing, that around lately. So here's the thing. So it's a priest romance. So what that means is, you know, we're doing some blasphemous things here, which is fine. Great. It's Whatever. Part of, it's a part of the point, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's in his point of view. It's not in the girl's character's point of view. Ooh, this is in the point of view of the priest. That's interesting. So it's kind of interesting there. Yeah, because um, you get that whole, like, oh, my however, face forbids me to, but... However, at the same time, it turn- It seems like he wasn't, a, like, starting out as a priest in the first place. Like, he fell into it after he did a whole bunch of stuff. Mm. And mm-hmm. so, there's no backstory so far yet as to why he's a priest or why well, he fell into 6% it. You are 6% in. Yeah, and so I'm kind of <laughs> sticking around to see... Like who, like Hopefully, what his story is. Yeah. yeah. Oh, uh, that's meanwhile, cool. Tony uh, decided to really just make me go and She sorry. almost said, Tony hates me. That, I, did you hear it, did you hear it, dear listeners? Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, just saying. Akatar. <laughs> We're reading Akatar. Yeah. I'm like a few pages in, so I don't have any thoughts at this moment. <laughs> but hopefully afterwards I will cleanse my palate from losing Neverland and Priest with Akatar and um, the Little White Horse by... Who is this? Elizabeth? Oh, Elizabeth Gooch? Yeah. Yeah, you said you were um, reading that. I want to start reading that one because there's a movie called The Secret of Moonacre. And it's it's this it's the book, but made into a movie. They just changed the name of it. So should I tell you, like... No. I, should, is this, is this I shouldn't tell you my favorite transphobic fact about little, The Little White Horse? Not yet. Well, Little White Horse nor Elizabeth Gooch are transphobic oh, as far okay. as I know. It's just related to, you know... Today. Is it a spoiler? No, it's not a spoiler at all. Oh, then go ahead. It was one of J.K. Rowling's favorite books. Oh, yeah, I saw that on the front cover. <laughs> I just seriously yeah, said Which is why she has it. a blurb, because it's literally one of her favorite books on the cover, and I think they brought it back into print after she said that in an interview of her some To be honest, thing, so. I don't care what Turf Rowling thinks. No, so, Elizabeth um, Gooch is a really good writer. I've read, yeah. like, I've sampled um, her writing. She's meanwhile, a, she's a solid you know, writer. What's her last name again? Gooch? Gooch. 
G O U D G E. Yeah. Just making sure. Meanwhile, uh-huh. um, you're, I'm playing Sims because when am I not? Um, I started a whole entire save over the weekend where it was really great and I had a doctor and she was fantastic and I loved her. Mm-hmm. Um, gosh, I explained this to my friend the other day where basically she was like all this, like doing all this great stuff. She went on a blind date with this really unflirty guy and it really sucked. And then she went on another blind date because I'm playing with the new pack. Sure. Which is a whole romance pack. And then she went on a date with a guy who hates kids. And to be honest, she really liked him. And I was like, that's fine. There's a retrading potion that I can get later on and retrade him. So he actually likes kids. It's fine. <laughs> <That's> brilliant. <laughs> and then the game decided to corrupt my file. So uh, that didn't oh. get to happen. Um, so now I'm back to my vampire save where I'm on Gen 3. Now. Nice. And yeah. so I have this teen named Seraphine, and she's adorable, and I love her, and she's living by herself because yeah. uh, she didn't want to really stick around with her parents because they're really super lovey-dovey, and she hated that. Um, <laughs> so she left, and so right now she's sitting in high school. She's made friends with, like, two of the most evil Sims, and that really tracks for her because they're her favorite kind of people, hilariously enough. Um, she sounds like she's about to fall into some bizarre paranormal activity. So here's the thing. I'm also going to move them into a haunted house after this. There you go. There it is. I was going to say, this sounds like a paranormal romance um, YA from the heyday. What's really cool is that uh, Sims added uh, polyamory to the game Mm. in in like a little fun area. And so... Oh, we took them. Took him forever. Five, five games. Ten years. Four, yeah. um, <laughs> took him like ten years. And so uh, what I'm doing is she's going to move into the house with her two uh, boy toys who are part of the same like little club of evil dudes. Nice. So it's fine. And so one, <laughs> one of them is completely like mafia boss and the other one is like... I really don't care, so I think he's going to be the ghost hunter of the crew. Oh, fun. Um, I love a good ghost hunter. So he's going to do that because that's an actual job that you can get in the game. Of course it is. And because I still want to live out my doctor dreams and she's a vampire, so she's changing them into vampires so they don't die because she wants them to stay. Um, Meanwhile, anybody else that they bring into the fold is definitely not going to be one because I don't care enough about them. Um, But she's going to be a doctor a la Carlisle Cullen, except she's going to be uh, snacking on the orderly every once in a while. So, well, yeah. You know, I mean, you know. There's that. It's the point of being a vampire doctor if you don't snack on the yeah, orderly. Yeah, and so every that's kind of how I'm playing it so far, but right now she's still a teen. Um, sure. And that is. God, that would have made Grey's Anatomy so much more interesting. Someone <laughs> out there in the universe. Actually, Grey's Anatomy. If you're not Aaron. <laughs> Aaron, you should do this too. But someone out there in the universe, please write me a Grey's Anatomy meets Vampire Diaries mashup. I'll read it all day. Say less. Read it all day. Yeah, Say well, less, I'll do right. it. Good. I have, I have to watch Grey's Anatomy so I can get the vibe first, but I got you. It's a medical drama. I know. I, watch I've House. only watched the ER. <laughs> That'll, that'll do you because <laughs> you know there's no such thing as Grey's Anatomy without ER so you're good so uh, yeah um, that's what I've done I like your entertainment updates both of you but I yeah. have a question yeah for Grant, Grant? <laughs> <laughs> you two think you can so you know you know what I've named you know what I named this episode this is called Tales from the Front Desk oh oh I love that do you want to know why because you know oh. what we're talking about today we're talking about what Grant does all day. So, Grant, what do you do? Uh, What's what your are, job what, what description? Are you doing? Um, I mope. I regret. I oh oh oh, you mean it's oh, no, I'm working here. Okay. Well, you might mope and regret at work. I mean, I mean yeah, I'm a multitasker. <laughs> exactly. So, yes, at the Adrian District Library, what is your official job title? Um, I am a library clerk. And what does that mean? A library clerk, well, it kind of entails many things, I guess. Um, Mm -hmm. Most of the time, you will find the clerk at the desk. That's Um, why this is Tales from the Front Desk. Yes, yes. Either the front desk or the youth department. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, we uh, we check in, check out books for patrons. We uh, order stuff for patrons, answer Mm -hmm. questions. Mm -hmm. Uh, we shelve things. Um, Really, we we process books, depending on who you are or whatever. Yeah. Um... There are people I mean, with many hats. People with many hats. And different clerks have different responsibilities. What stuff. are yours? Yeah. What are my responsibilities? Yeah, because we're trying to learn about <laughs> yes. what people yeah, do in libraries. Are, like, so specific what, things. We're trying to learn that... about what people do here in libraries. So, like, what? what's your particular thing? What do you get to do all day? <laughs> you think you can break me? I've been trained for this. You can't <laughs> <get anything. laughs> I did tell him we were going to Chinese torture him, so, you know. <laughs> oh, so you trained for Chinese torture. Yes. 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 So did you mention the waterboarding, too? 
No, we hadn't gotten that. Far. Listen, oh. me, and, listen <laughs> me and my friends waterboarded each other for fun. Oh, well, <laughs> all right. This is going to be Jeez. uncomfortable for listeners, but we're all no, good. I'm, joking. <laughs> I'm not joking yes. about that, but I, I will answer questions. Yes. Um, <laughs> I uh, good. <laughs> I will say, like in the other things as um, assigned yeah, section, yes. I um, I deal with donations a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, look through them, make sure they're okay to either add to the collection if they're new enough or if there's just something we'd like or if they're going to end up in the book sale mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. or um, just to be sorted through by the friends of the library who help us out with that stuff. Sure. Um, yeah. So we accept donations. We do accept donations as long as they're not the sources. Yeah, <laughs> and right, all, yes. many other things which I will not get into at the moment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. Um, what would you say is your... I'm going to start with favorite, but there are other mm-hmm. other qualifiers. What is your favorite aspect of your job at this point in time? At this point in time, um, probably helping people track stuff down. Yeah. Or a reader's advisory, I guess. Sure. Yeah. Which isn't something that I get to do a lot, but it's always fun when I do. Yeah. Um, I like doing that. Honestly, I like organizing stuff. Sure. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. So. Yeah, um, that's true. Yeah, that's literally yeah. part of the job. Right. Yeah, you do right. that so, organize something. Yeah, so if I get a chance to like shelf read or something, I'll definitely take that just to nice give my brain a little uh, little vacation for a few minutes. Yeah, so. it does. Ha- yeah, it is. So, Aaron, you started working here I as did. a library clerk, right? I also started working here as a library clerk, and I think something that is commonly misunderstood. Not by the public, but I think it's certainly something that is misunderstood by the library world, maybe. Mm-hmm. Um, because oftentimes when people talk about like clerks, they are they, they either praise clerks for too much or they don't praise them enough. And yeah. I always feel like that's apart from the point. To me, when I especially when I was a library clerk, something that I wish more people had helped me understand is that this is not a stepping stone job. Do you know what I mean? Like, like it was always, there's always this sort of weird implication of like, oh, the library clerks is where you start, and then you'll go on and do other things. Like, and it's like, no, without the library clerks, there isn't a library. Like, you don't, who's going to check in all of those books and check them back out again, right? I mean, sure, the rest of us know how to do it, but it's because we started as library clerks. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, like. I think that yeah. the main thing is, is that like, they're kind of, library clerks, in my opinion, are kind of like the underestimated backbone of the whole building. Absolutely. Because the thing with library clerks is they are outside of like, yeah, so, you know, as a librarian, like, yeah, I do public facing things all the time. Like, I talk to people, I do things, I do reference questions and things like that. The clerks do it more than I do. Way more. At this point. Mm-hmm. Granted, no, I'm not a social person, so, you know, that's great. Have fun. But um, but how did you feel when you were a library clerk doing it? Like, what was yeah, your feeling at the time, like, when you were... It was great because, like, here's the thing. Like, as the public-facing person, you're often there able to answer questions. You're helping people find things more often than I am. Mm-hmm. You're able to not only help people more often with those kind of things because you're on the pu- in public facing areas more often mm-hmm. but you're helping them with technology questions you're helping them out with uh printing you're helping just them out doing anything that they really ask for within a specific like purview because you know sometimes mm. some questions sometimes you have are to push up but yeah yeah, yeah sometimes right. some questions yeah. are just a little too much yeah. but like at the same time they're kind of, library clerks are kind of the backbone because they're the ones who are sitting there at you know like frontline workers like in a library yeah, library clerks are basically the frontline workers mm-hmm. because they yeah. are the ones who are there on the desk all day every day inside and out they have to know not only like how to do some of the procedures of like helping out with tech things but they have to be able to find things on the shelf they have to be able to direct people places give directions mm-hmm. like they do all that I do but like at the same time they do it more often there's definitely a learning curve when you first start because there's, yeah. there's a yes. lot to learn yeah there is yeah and I feel like so like the pu- 
Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm trying to figure I'm out how to this question. Public, this. public versus private. Okay, so so the public facing side of the job, right, is definitely what you end up doing more of, I think, than anything, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, do you feel like the public side of your job often gets in the way of your other duties or is it the other way around like do you feel like you're like having a duty to do on desk is kind of annoying and pointless because hey there's another person right you know what I mean like I mean I mean by I mean personally speaking by my constitution I'm not a very sociable person although Mm -hmm. in those instances where I can help people find something I do enjoy that yeah um so I do enjoy working on something but I won't say like because I'd hate to scare people away from approaching the desk. You know. <laughs> please approach the desk. Yes, please approach us. We are us. here for you to ask us, yes. patrons. But yes, <laughs> I, personally, I, I enjoy working more than I do, you know, the, the public yes. interaction. Yeah, but, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But does does it like get in the way? No, I, I understand that it's it's like two halves of the same job. So it is, and I think it's one of those things where like. Uh, because you don't know what the next question is going to be. Mm-hmm. Yeah. S- it's nice when there's a surprise. Like, mm-hmm. like, like, within a certain, like, I used to hate, and I still hate, technology questions. Ugh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Ugh. No, I, I just want to, like... it just depends. I wish it depended. I even hate the, hey, I'm printing something, because in my brain, I'm going, this person probably did not print this correctly, which means I'm going to go have to look and see what's wrong with their <laughs> printer, which means I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes, and even though that's... Hi, not highly unlikely. Even though it's probably not going to happen, you're already just. I'm already undefensive, which is dumb, right? But it's because I hate answering tech questions. Like I, mm-hmm. I hate, I hate it. It because it makes me uncomfortable. Not because the patron is wrong. You're not patrons. It's, be, it's well, yes, okay. Sometimes, don't but, say that. But it's, okay. more, it's, 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 it's more the sense. That, it's more the sense that like it makes me as a human being uncomfortable mm-hmm. because it's not my strong suit. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, like tech questions are not my strong. Whereas you know. they are mine because I sit there and I do yeah. tech on mm-hmm. like the daily at my own house. Mm-hmm. Whereas like, if, a, if you know if a, if a person comes up to the desk and is like, "Hey, I'm looking for a book in this genre that you've never read," like if somebody came up to the desk and was like, "Hey, I need a good self help book." That's not my strong area either. But you know what is my strong area? Researching books for people to read. Do it all day. So that. Yeah. I'm way more comfortable there, and I feel like that, like, when I was a clerk, it, like, my, I felt like I was sharper than I've ever been as a library clerk, to be perfectly honest, because you have to be, like, you're on, you're constantly navigating questions, but one of my questions to you is, uh, um, <laughs> how does that, like, in terms of energy, input and output, like, how does that, how do you manage that? Day in and day out, I guess is my question. That's a really terrible way of putting it. But. So, like, <laughs> like burnout almost. Like, like yeah. Like, how do you avoid the... burnout? Like, oh. as a library clerk, because you're constantly front facing. That yeah. is kind of like a common thing that happens. There's yeah, a lot of burnout happens. Yeah, I mean, I mean, personally, I'm always asking if there's any odd job that needs done that can <laughs> yeah. physically get me away from the desk. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. No, I think that's no. But, but yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I think mean, that's fair. Saying, you know, it's yeah. the truth. But um, yeah, and, and I like to help out. So you know, if there's <laughs> You, you, you know, um, that and uh, I'm trying to think of like anything else I do to manage that. Um, mm. At the moment, I can't. Emergency sure. yeah. chocolate helps. Chocolate a lot. helps. Yes. Have we ever have we ever talked about the emergency? No, chocolate we have an emergency drawer? chocolate drawer. So yes, at the at the main desk, we have an emergency chocolate drawer. As everyone should. For us, yes, as all yes, everyone who works with the public should have <laughs> a an emergency chocolate drawer because. Any of you who do work for the public, and this does include you teachers, uh, you all know that we need those moments of not only power down, like the 15-minute break is a serious affair, um, but also you need a boost. And there's nothing like caffeine on the brain after dealing with human beings that just, you know. I can deal with the individual human. Yes. But yes, humans in bulk. After a while, you need something to. Yeah. So okay. So what is attractive about working as a library clerk? Like, what is something that it, even if it doesn't excite you necessarily, but like, if it, what is something that you look forward to doing mm. when you come to work? Forward to doing. Other um, than talking to Tony. I mean, well, yes. <laughs> well, of course, every single day we want 
to talk to Tony? Oh, God, no. No, even I don't want to do that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yes, carry on. Uh, okay, what do I look forward to? I definitely look forward to seeing the uh, new donations. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's just, just me because I've, quite a few times I've caught something that I've never heard of. Isn't it kind of like opening presents? It, it, it feels like it. Sometimes. That's how I feel about ordering books. Mm-hmm. It's like opening presents. Yeah. You never know what you're going to get. Yeah, um, exactly. Especially with donations. Yeah. 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 Um, that's always fun. I love I love going to like resale stores and stuff. So that's and I used to work at a resale store, so it's oh, nice. kind of right up my alley. I love to just look through old stuff. Yeah. Um, that's always something I look forward to. I look forward to the podcast every two months, every twice every month. Yeah, it's like every um, two months. Oh well, yeah. Every, um, <laughs> yes. No. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No. I just. I just. Uh, it's. I mean, I can't speak for every library in the nation, but. Right. At the ADL, we have a very um, smooth um, rapport with everybody, I guess. um, Sure. uh, Everything is, I don't know, I just like the, uh, we have a good vibe here. Um, Vibe? It feels feels friendly. Yeah, like you feel like patrons feel like well taken care of here, well assisted. I'm not, the words are not here. Okay, yeah, yeah. Like, you feel like there's a good rapport between patrons and staff, as well as, like, between staff. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to think we kind of give out that energy to people. I would hope so, yeah. Yeah. Um, So, what is something, as a clerk, this is a dangerous question to ask (laughs) you, because, you know, of certain people who do listen to this podcast. Am I going to have to cut this out? No, 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 no. (laughs) What is something that if you could change about what library clerks do, and not just you, but, like, the clerks in this building, what is something that you personally might change about something that the clerks do? Hmm. So, like, adding... Okay. Um... It's a good, that is a good that question. That is a dangerous a, question, yeah. too. <laughs> yes! Differently, I think... I think... Uh, this is such a specific complaint, though. Sure. It's not a complaint. Ooh, it's not a complaint. Okay. No, I, I think we should have more uh, book sales, like, every other month. Um, sure. I think... I feel I like think, that's a specific, like... Not even to like us. Not even clear. Yeah, no, See, no. I'm trying to think of something. <laughs> no, no, but that's not No, it's good. No, I like it. Like, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, like, more, yeah. co- like, like, how many book sales a month would you say we could sustain since a part of your job is seeing oh, like, it like, all like, and curating it all? Like once a month or something. I sure. Think, yeah. Uh, you know, even, I think one or two people could uh, easily hold down a bi monthly or monthly yeah. book sale. Um, yeah. Yeah. In the community room or whatever. Um, yeah. And, and the re- I guess the reason I thought of that is just because that's something probably you know you could just get a clerk to do. So. Yeah. No. I think. Yeah. Exactly. No. I think. I think that's that. That again is one of the things that like I've enjoyed about this series, mm-hmm. and I'm hoping that people, that patrons who are listening, um, listeners to this podcast, even if you're not our patrons, I hope that people, sort of, come away with an understanding of the fact that every person who works at this library has a voice to say, hey, here's something I would do, or here's something that I like to do, or here's something, you know what I mean? Because I think, like, there's this weird higher... It, I say it's weird because it is, but it's normal every, in every part of the planet. Hierarchy, right? In, mm-hmm. in workplaces, right? Um, and it's one of the things that I feel like we've gotten... I don't want to say around because we do have a chain of command, but like in a way, in the ways that it matters, I feel like we've gotten around that yeah. whole ch- that whole like the, like I said, there is a chain of command. So like if there's a problem, here's the person you go to, or if you need a project, here's the person you go to. But in terms of like hierarchy, people thinking this position is better because they have more hours, or this position is better because they have more responsibility, or this position is better for like, or whatever, or even people in those positions thinking, oh, well, I have more to do or I'm more, you know, authoritative or whatever. I think that's just not true of our particular library. I can't speak for the rest of the library world. And I do think that that does contribute to how we serve the public, if that makes sense. You know what I mean? I think that's how... Um, if library clerks don't feel like, and I, I speak as a former library clerk, um, if <laughs> we don't feel like we're being, like, you know, put down by people who are here more often, or people who have a degree, or multiple, or people who, whatever the hierarchy may be. The public thinks we're all librarians anyways. They do, yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Do. Yeah, how often do people call you librarians? 
often, and I don't correct them. <laughs> right, no, me neither, because... What, there's, there's no because point. There's no point in correcting there's them no anyway. Point. Yeah, but, if, but, but to finish my point, um, is it, it, I think that that helps us all to know that we're not here for any of that. We're here for the people who come in the building, and mm -hmm. they could care less whether or not having a master's degree makes you a librarian because they just want to no. print their thing and ship their box back. Like, that's, that's all they care about. <laughs> they <laughs> just want to print their vacation plane ticket, to be honest. Right. That's it. Yeah, or, Like, let you know, them print the vacation plane ticket. Pass the exam we have to proctor. Because, I, I you know. will also say that, like, I think, so coming from, you know, clerk to, you know, assistant to, like, librarian. librarian like, yeah, you scaled the... I did scale the whole thing. <laughs> we talk about this job not being a stepping stone, and here I am. Well, you didn't step on anybody to get there. I did there. not, just, but you know, I will say that, like, lot. one of the things that, like, I would recommend, especially for people who are going into the library world... Yeah, yeah. They should be a library clerk first. I completely I'm agree. not saying that, like, they shouldn't, like become a librarian i'm not saying anything like that yeah. i think if anybody is w wanting to even just like look at being a librarian or just like wants to look work in a library before you sit there and you go like oh i want to go to like the most highest paying job or whatever work as a clerk first <laughs> not because mm -hmm. not because you know it's you know a stepping stone or anything like that right but because w there's a lot of misconception about like what and that's what the series does is like what libraries like actually do and as somebody who's worked both retail and you know not library retail. clerk <laughs> yeah right it's similar but not really so like if you have retail experience you can bring that over but like if you've never had any experience doing those kind of things or if you've been mm -hmm. in academia the whole entire time and you want to do library work do a public facing like library clerk first yeah. Because that will get you into the mindset of what you need to, like, even, like, move up that ladder. Or, yeah. like, even scale the mountain, however you want to say Or it. even just to because... do something else within the library world that you... Yeah. Like, like, there are people who find out as library clerks, like, oh, I don't like front-facing, you know, that kind of thing. So they find a position where they can yeah. be a little bit more in the back the well, background of how libraries work. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly and, what and, I did. And I think, you know... Tony's trying to find a nice way to I put think this. I would say that that path makes more sense to me than the reversal, right? Like, I wouldn't necessarily want someone who's only done like background library work to be all like, all right, I'm gonna go be a clerk because there's a the learning curve is steep, and I don't think it's not that I don't think. I think that it would be harder. That's yeah. what I would say. I think it would be harder to be like, oh, I've done marketing in libraries my whole life. And then let's, for some reason, you have a hiatus and you want to go back and you just, you know, and you, then you, have you to go, go as a library as clerk. Help, yeah. I think it would be much harder because it, it, all of the things that you once influenced are now literally in your face. Like people are literally asking you direct questions or people, you know, and you go from marketing that thing. And then all of a sudden now you're the front facing and then you have to wake up like five people from sleeping. Yeah, and right. Each yeah. of them have a completely separate reaction to being woken up in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like one of like the public other public facing facets that like people don't really like know about, especially like as a clerk or even just a library job in general is like. There's a lot of there's a lot of things that. that we have to do that like a lot of people would be like wait you have to do that I had to clean one of the restrooms the other day oh god and I went home and I told my parents hey they were like how'd your day go and I went well I cleaned one of the restrooms it's like I have a master's degree and I cleaned a bathroom and they were like wait you have you have to clean the restroom and I went yeah because if it gets dirty we don't have somebody to come clean it until the very end of the day. Right, and, and so then you have a bathroom need, out of commission all day. Yeah, like, there's, like, no point. So, like, there's a lot of things that we do, like, that Grant does that's, like, public-facing that, like, at the same time, if you're not prepared or trained for it... It can be really challenging, and that's what you get that, that, that learning curve. All right, so here's the, like, the this question the no one should ask, right? <laughs> but we already asked, what's your favorite thing? <laughs> so I have, so I have to ask, 
what is not, I don't want to say the least favorite thing because that's a little too easy. Um, <laughs> what is the most challenging aspect of being this a sounds like a job cook interview for you? <laughs> yeah, I know it does. Yeah. <laughs> my, my job interview is actually fine. Um, yeah. Nice. Well, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. Well, yeah. Good. Good. yeah. Good. It's compared to, especially compared to some other ones that I had. So. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, the most challenging part. Um, I would definitely agree with you on tech questions for a few reasons because A, um, tech problems tend to lead to raised tempers. Um, <laughs> they do. Yes. B, they do. B, the people who have tech problems either refuse to acknowledge that they don't know what they're doing mm. or... <laughs> no, it's true. Um, okay. Yeah, basically that. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so so it's just not conducive to a pleasant experience for anyone involved. Um, right. And I've encountered more rude patrons um, helping them with technical issues than in any other situation. I would say I have to agree with that. Yeah. Sure. So Patrons, we love all of you. Just saying. So that way, yeah. <laughs> just take computer class. Just I'm just like, kidding. I'm just, just like all kidding. soldiers are Schedule a one-on-one -on -one <laughs> with us. No, no, but seriously, yeah, it is. I, I feel like that's that's definitely like... That that can be a, a canker sore on the job, right? Yes, because and, and because we're not necessarily tech people. I mean, we're mm -hmm. not. I some of us are, but you know. <laughs> and also, um, we're not necessarily nice people. So, like, yeah, my job, an aspect of our job, we can all agree, right? Is like as public servants, we're getting paid to put on a persona for people, right? Like that's we all right. agree with that, right? Okay, so. So when you roll up to the club and tell the bouncer, <laughs> like, you know, what any number of disrespects that you might say to the bouncer, um, you're going to get bounced back. Mm -hmm. And it may not be in a way that you enjoy, which is not what we want. That That's not our job. That's not what we want from our job. And it could cause trouble for us as well as the patron. Mm -hmm. So nobody wants that, right? Yeah. But at the same time, if you just show up and you don't know how to do something, and you know that you don't know how to do something, I recognize the embarrassment factor there. But you showed up not knowing how to do something, mm -hmm. and now you're mad when there there isn't a solution. Yes, and they don't, and and they may or may not actually want to hear our solution. They just it, really most of the time they just want us to do it for them. Exactly. Yes, and that and that is like like to to your you know, point of like why it's the most challenging. It's it's frustrating when you encounter a when you have a bad patron encounter like that because it puts you on guard for the next time someone asks not only mm -hmm. a question, but that question, right? So like for example, if you wanting to print something led to a whole 15 minute thing where by the end of it you were mad and you left and you were complaining about why this is why no one goes to libraries, you know, whatever. Yes, that does happen. Um you know, the next time someone asks me a question about printing, maybe they want to know how much it, how much they get charged. Mm -hmm. That's it. But I'm still going to be like the last person who did this cussed me out. I don't know how I'm going to. You know, it's it and yeah. I mean, the moral of the yeah. story is anyway. be nice to service workers. Please, yes, please. like <laughs> it, it would make our it would make things easier. We're and, trying our best. You know, part of being nice is just saying, hey, I don't know this. Are you trying your best? So, I, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. One of the most challenging parts of my job is when people steal things that I can't replace. It really irritates me. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, <laughs> it's just, I'm just being a little shady. It's <laughs> fine. Um, but no, in, a, in, in general, would you say, for the last question of the day, would you say that this is something, a job that you very, very much, not very much, I'm not going to put words in your mouth, is this a job that you enjoy and are you glad that you work here? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> good. I'm glad you're like After working. the negativity of the last 10 yes. minutes, like, yeah. Because, like, yeah. you know, the next, yeah. next episode's going to be about uh, the next fun part of the library. Weeding books. Ooh, I'm excited about that. Actually, me too, yeah. That yeah, we're going to be talking about that next episode, so join us for that. I feel like there's a lot of new things. There are. Get your card. Get your card.